right? And these are, these are probably sicker than average prostate cancer patients because you can wait 10 years or these are cash resistant prostate cancers. They're metastatic. They're already very sick, uh, but they're chemo naive. And we can keep these people alive for, for years now, thankfully. Uh, used to be six months. Uh, thanks to the drug industry, you can see the median overall survival now is 24 months, which is amazing. Uh, thanks to these new new medicines. Um, so as this has happened, these overall survival studies, you can see 4,000 patients in a prostate cancer study. You only you need you needed 300 patients back in the day because the the uh, the amount of events you get was enormous. Here, the events are still large because it's cancer, but you still need a sample size that's big because you're not getting many events. Yeah. Here, you're not going to get a lot of events uh, for mortality. This is so, a fatal disease. Martin, fatal. just to kind of zoom out, because I, I agree with everything you're saying, but maybe just to kind of circle back to, I think, my point, which is maybe one tier like above what you're talking about. Like, what you're talking about is a little bit more microscopic. But in this case, 5,000 people didn't get the vaccine, right? It's a placebo. Yeah. No one died. In two months? No one Nobody died. died in either arm. <laughs> Well, no, no, but some people still got the illness, right? I guess, what was it, 123 people got the illness in the placebo group? Yeah. And, and I mean, maybe you disagree, but, like, I mean, if we think that COVID's lethal, it's going to happen quickly after getting it, right? Like, the, the ARDS response comes from the tissue in your lungs swelling and the distance from the alveoli and the, you know, your blood. Everyone in this room is listening has gotten COVID. It doesn't mean anybody died. I got COVID. Not get COVID. One percent. I'd be curious to do a sampling, like how many people got a vaccine and then later got COVID. That would be an interesting statistical sample to take. That is I, this I, I don't believe I got COVID. I would say my father, my, my father is sixty-seven, and after his first Pfizer vaccine, he had his first sort of seizure. But I don't chalk it up to the vaccine because I don't have a crystal ball. On our personal anecdotes, the point I'm making is that this is. Oh, but no, if you integrate the sum of antidotes, you can do statistics, right? I mean, if we have 50 people in here. Oh, come on. Yeah, I don't chalk it up to the vaccine. I don't have a crystal ball. This is a medical miracle. Like, this this is unbelievable. Like, this is, you cannot pray for a better trial. When I saw it, I. I think the numbers are very impressive and. I, if, if I have any skepticism, it's like, are we trusting Pfizer to tell us about its own medicine. Well, well, so that's that's one thing that, that makes sense. But then Moderna had the same damn result. And then when it was done in different countries, it had the same result. So like you saw this replicated uh, result. And by so the way, replicated. OK, you know, the, the people, the people that published in the New England, <laughs> like, there's no conspiracy. If you ever sat down with a steering committee or a room of these types of people, as, as I have, there's no yeah. love. There's no fucking friendships like these people yeah. are out. Of, and they'll just as soon tear you down than uh, let you in. And certainly, look, these, these, some of these journals have made mistakes. Lancet published uh, the, the vaccine autism thing a long time ago. Right. Um, when you have a 95% reduction in incidence, I think that's impressive. And then when you have, again, the mortality, even if you say 5% of, of people, right, 5% of people die from COVID, which is, is a, quite an overestimate for a healthy person contracting COVID, um, you still sort of have a, um, a problem here where, you know, you're, you're not going to have a lot of power. This is enough power, by the way. but you can't do a 200,000 patient clinical trial. Such a trial has never been done. You know, so you need to find a sample size that's comfortable enough to, to that has enough power or alpha to detect at, you know, 0.05. Uh, power is beta, not alpha. Um, well, what, what would it cost? What would it cost to do power, this study? Beta, it and what would it cost to do a study power. with a hundred, with a hundred thousand, with two hundred thousand people? I think it'd be the biggest clinical trial in the history of mankind. Uh, they did forty thousand on one of the one of the other trials. Um, it's a great example of how people can be sold anything. Is it? I don't think so. <laughs> well, of course you would say that. Ooh, I mean, you're, you're revealing. You think you made it? It's just, good I, I, I believe in being skeptical, but I, I find uh, the ongoing continued skepticism a little confusing. 
I don't know what you guys like. So what, why, why is the vaccine worth taking based on this study? Just clearly state why you think it's worth taking. I think that, you know, relative to all the other vaccines we trust, and, you know, I understand this might be like a sloppy syllogism. Um, mankind civilization has trusted the vaccines that have less efficacy than this one. And there's this public health dilemma where you can't do a clinical trial of your whole country. It doesn't work. You have to do a trial of some group of people and then a vaccine committee, ACIP in this case, ACIP decides and recommends, is this something everyone should do? Because you can't sort of have half buy-in on, on herd immunity. Everybody has to agree we're going to all be immune. And then you sort of hope. And if that's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable. That's okay. But you sort of hope that that vaccine that clearly in this case works, uh, at least for, again, for two months, I can show you longer curves. It, it works for six months too. Um, I, I think I would just like to see longer curves, to be honest. I don't really have anything against this study, but it's just, there's, these results are, mean nothing to me. I mean, maybe they mean, it sounds like this, this other guy talking is like really sold by this. So, I mean, obviously some people really think this is a valuable paper, but I mean, as someone who does statistics for a living, this, this is extremely unimpressive. You should read... Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. How I mean, this if, if I presented this in a, in a work environment to, like, say that we should do X or Y, this would be laughed at. No, this this was um, hailed as a medical miracle by, by everyone. I don't, I, mean, I don't know how you can possibly say that and then claim to work in statistics. Yeah, that's an incredible result. Um, well, so can I just can I just reiterate? You guys right. didn't answer. Like, so wh why are you taking the vaccine as a result of this study? Like, what is what is the conclusion of the study that makes you want to take the vaccine? Um, I mean, this wasn't some like leak. And I mean, if you don't want to answer, that's fine. I, I'm not trying to like gotcha. I'm just I'm trying to understand. But the, the, don't try to gaslight me. Like, I'm not the the first person that that thought that this was an incredible success. Everybody thought this was an incredible success. Oh, okay. So trust the group. I gotcha. In the medical establishment, there's nobody that thought that this was a bad result like like how do you do hmm. better that's that's not how i do my reasoning like i don't i don't just i, I have to convince myself right i'm giving you some reasoning like this wasn't are you trying to get a hundred percent vaccine efficacy no no sorry but just so much are you saying because people said it's a success it's a success is that what you're saying your own eyes and see with a 95 percent reduction you know okay in, you're not going to answer the question i'm telling you that that there wasn't anybody who was stupid enough to say that a 95% reduction in, in the clinical of what? Health. No, like you're getting, tri this is where you, this is, sorry, Martin, this is why I'm saying you're getting tricked. You keep saying efficacy, but you're not appending to that what the actual endpoint is. Two months of, of COVID remittance. That's garbage. That's, that's worthless. That's, uh, and that's honestly, that's our only difference. I mean, if, if you think that's valuable, then I understand where you're getting your I, conclusion. I, I don't I, think that's worth anything. I think if I showed that graph to any business decision maker, they would uh, feel very um, confident making okay. any any decision based you, on that graph. Thank you for sharing that view. That was really valuable information. I have a master's in business administration, work in a bank. I've taught statistics. I'm not surprised that an MBA would be convinced by a statistical I've taught chart statistics like this. on the master's level. Can, can nothing I think you're full of shit. I think like, Chewy is full of shit, honestly. This is another. This is another. It's not an argument. We don't have to drop down, but this is another example. There, I've seen six month data. I mean, it's it's all the same, dude. It's it's still 95. Why didn't you link the six month data? And that'd be more convincing, right? I, I just pointed to the first. The New England Journal was published. A litany of studies about this stuff um so we can go through i don't really know why you guys aren't just answering like i'm not, I'm not trying to gotcha i'm just like I like you look this study. it takes time to look up this stuff you haven't shown me any data no, no, no. sorry Mario. i'm just i'm just asking the same question which is i mean you guys are saying this is amazing data like why why does this convince you to take the vaccine i'm genuinely i'm not trying to gotcha i'm well, literally just trying said, to understand like said, as i said i defer other people. my decision as to whether or not i should take the vaccine to asip Okay, to okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that's that's trust the expert, right? No. Or is that ASIP is is an expert group of of public health people. That you're trusting. You're trusting this expert group. Do I have that correct? The public health groups Let him finish, please. Like ASIP have done an incredible job of eradicating malaria, measles, mumps by 
by instituting policies for vaccines that have saved lives. And they think that this is a good idea for everyone to take this vaccine. I think that's, it, when I look at the data, since I have the capability of doing that, I don't see anything but the best vaccine I've ever seen in pharmaceuticals. Well, and like you're saying, the main thing is that other people have said it's a good vaccine. So I look and at the data myself and I see it's not other people. These are the most eminent experts in public health. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, really experienced people that is, yeah. that is good. I have had a track record of incredible success. The U.S. FDA and the ACIP and all of that has resulted in remarkably low mortality for infants versus countries that don't have that, say Africa or Pakistan or Bangladesh, where they have enormous amounts of MMR and kids die when they're three months old because they're skeptics that, that think that, you know, they know better than the experts. And, you know, we have a group of experts that are trained to do this and they think it's a good idea. And then when you look, couple that, when you look at the results and you see that they're better, 95% efficacy, better than any other vaccine I've ever seen, you know, I don't, I mean, it's like a no brainer. Oh yeah, no, I think that's a great way of putting it, no brainer. I feel like uh, Chewie's just a disrespectful troll, honestly. No, no, I, I mean, we just differ in our reasoning. Like, I don't put as much faith in, in these, like, expert groups, but th that makes sense. Like, I mean, that's, you came that's in here you... talking down to Martin, like, when he's already clearly got a lot of experience and credibility in this See, subject area. You know, and, you not, and you did not stop doing that the entire conversation. He sounded sincere. He just. I think, I think, I think I'm not questioning his sincerity. So, since Martin gave his answer, Aaron, um, you said that you thought the study was very compelling. Again, since I want to. I want to know what you do trust. I want to. I want to know, uh, Mr. Skeptic. What do you trust? What sources of information do you trust? Well, I mean, like I said earlier, I certainly don't think this study is very compelling. But I'm curious. Uh, you keep, like, why, you keep why... running down this study, but what do you trust? You take. I'm confused. Well, let me ask you. I, I guess I'll, I'll take over the, the floor I, for a second. I don't know why it's a gotcha just asking you guys why you think this is a bit, like a good study. I'm just trying to learn like what you guys are seeing. I, I think, could be missing. I think something. the gotcha is asking you what you trust because you don't Aaron, trust anything. Aaron, let, me, let me let me take the floor for a second, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> if you don't mind, do you have children? And you don't have to answer if you don't want. But would you want your children, if you had them hypothetically, to take MMR vaccines? Oh, good question. Do you want me to legitimately answer that or, yeah. or rhetorical? I mean, kind of like I said earlier, the data that I've seen shows that this illness is extremely age dependent, right? So based on that, the curves for children, I don't think warrant mandating that kids need it personally. Not, now, if the no. kid had asthma, or the kid had like an overweight thing, that would definitely factor in. But just I, I'm asking you about the MMR vaccine. Do you think children should take MMR vaccines? Oh, the measles, mumps, uh, rubella. Sorry, I thought you said mRNA. I apologize, I misunderstood what you asked. That's a good question. I mean, in those cases, I'm not as familiar. In those cases, if you get that vaccine, does it prevent you from transmitting it and re-getting re the, the mumps vi virus? Or is it like a two-month two efficacy? I don't think anybody knows. Well... I think we would, right? Because we've been, that's, that uh, vaccine has been used for like 50 years. Yeah. But we, do, we, so I mean, we, we should certainly know like way more than two months, it's right? Been, it's never been studied. Well, no, no, but it is implicitly being studied because we know the rates of, it's, it's mandated in schools. We know the rates at which it's been administered and the rate at which it's been treated. So even if we don't have a controlled study, we can still observe like a cross section of the population, right? As a statistician, you know that observational data is not the same as, you know, doing rigorous trial. Well, yeah, there's limitations to not doing a design study, but that doesn't mean, like, data that you've observed is thrown out. I mean, well, you could just say that... Look at, like, market. World War II planes. I'm sure you're familiar with the, the scenario of, like, the most reliable World War II planes and where the bullets were and the wings. I mean, that wasn't a controlled study, but that's an observation of, of empirical data, right? And there's insight that exists in there. So you don't need to do a design of experiment to get statistical insight. If you had a Absolutely not. 
if you had a child tomorrow, you would advocate for the MMR vaccine? How old is the child? Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to say mRNA. M MMR? When is that usually given? Is that like when they're, that's given like pretty young, right? There's an entire ASIP schedule, yes. Is not is it like right after they're born they get that? Or it's like two years or something? Or? Whole schedule of litany of these vaccines. You can go to the ASIP site. Do you, do you, would you give, listen to ASIP and listen to your pediatrician? I wouldn't. In all honesty, I wouldn't listen just because that committee says it, but I would look at the proof in the pudding, right? So I know that that has 50 years of data. And that to me has humongous precedence over even any of these controlled studies. Like the proof in the pudding, it's almost like a Boeing 747. Like, was there a statistical study on Boeing 747 that it would, that it would work? There was on the 737 MAX, and of course, planes fell out of the sky, right? But the 747 has a proven track record. There is immense value in that embedded fact that we've not observed significant reliability problems with it, right? So in the case of the MMR vaccine, I'm not familiar with it, but I haven't heard stories of people, you know, either getting getting mumps after getting that or, or having serious adverse events to where I would be inclined to think that is an excellent vaccine for kids to get. So if and when you have a child, this doesn't sound like you have one, um, there's a schedule of vaccines that's enormously long. Uh, kids have to take around a dozen vaccines. Will you look at the data for each of one of those, or will you just trust the, I guess what you're saying, sort of a mix of track record and a mix of... Yeah, seriously, like, honestly, the best analogy that comes to mind, do you remember when Windows Vista came out? Sure. So Windows Vista, Microsoft spent billions of dollars, all the smartest software engineers to create that product. And when it released, it had bugs, right? It was, it's notoriously known as a, a failed product that wasn't reliable, despite being avant-garde, despite being the, the cutting edge. And so that's a problem with new products. You see that with the 737 Max. There is a small chance that the product, despite being gone through all these validated processes, ends up failing to be better than the prior, right? That's the whole concept of a bathtub curve. In medicine, in medicine we right? just... I, I'm probably going over people's heads here, but bottom line is... If you have, we, don't yeah, throw things, we just don't throw new products out there like a software launch. We do clinical trials to, well, to but, determine whether yes. or not we want ASIP to recommend it. And when ASIP recommends well, it, everyone takes it. Okay. Well, yeah, again, I, I don't want to keep repeating myself. I don't, I don't agree with just like, just because some committee says to do it, to do it. But in the case okay. of different vaccines, exactly. you would know this better than me, right? There's safety and efficacy. Then there's layers and layers of more efficacy, right? So there's progression. Like, it's not, not like there's you're not going to tell your pediatrician what vaccines your kid's going to take and which which ones are good ideas and bad ideas based on your personal analysis of that. Or maybe. Oh, yeah, I don't I don't know how it's going to work. I think it I think the way it works is they're going to there's certain recommended vaccines to enroll your kids in programs. Right. All right. And, and like you said, your pediatrician is going to say we recommend that these vaccines be given. I don't are there mandates as well. I, I don't actually know. I'll give you an example. Prevnar 20 is brand new. It is literally brand new. Are you going to say, well, Prevnar 20 doesn't have a track record, so I'm not, I don't think my kid should take it. Ooh, that's, that's actually the best example, right? Because, th so that would actually be my visceral response. Like all else being equal, I would, I would not want to introduce exogenous interventions if I don't have a track record, but I don't know what, like, it would depend on the details, right? Like that vaccine, what is that treating? Is that treating like meningitis where I'm like, I know my kid's not going to be swimming in lakes and stuff like what, what is it treating because that's important most, most of the men meningococcal vaccines are brand new this is pneumococcal virus uh pneumococcal disease vaccine my point the point i'm making is that someone has to be the first right and this does, stuff doesn't work unless everyone takes it that's why there's an asap that's why they're for psoriasis nobody cares if you take the psoriasis cream or not it doesn't matter you can go to hell for all the psoriasis people care it doesn't make a difference it's not going to change me but if you don't vaccinate your kid for pneumococcal disease or meningococcal disease or MMR or COVID, what's going to happen is that kid becomes a vector. And this whole public health thing fails. That's why ASIP exists. Not because, you know, people like to give uh, takeaway freedom from people, because there needs to be some kind of, unfortunately, and I'm a libertarian, there has to be some sweeping wide sort of guidance given. And these are vaccines that are less controversial, but some of them are, are, are kind of new. Some of them are really old, but even the MMR vaccine, believe it or not, 
still is undergoing changes. Like Sanofi just released a six in one vaccine and it's brand new, but guess what? Like a half, half a million kids or a million kids, maybe, well, 4 million kids are born a year, 80, 90% of them, maybe more are going to get that vaccine, even though it's brand spanking new. And, and you can't get, you know, track record for a lot of these things unless you just try them. Uh, and, and that's sort of the way right, but not everyone has to try. Like, not everyone had to buy Windows Vista, right? And and the people that didn't actually kind of dodge the bullet on that, right? Healthcare, it's a bit different because everyone has to be vaccinated for this thing to work. Otherwise no, you no, with a huge amount of vaccine. not if it doesn't prevent transmission, it becomes an individual calculation at that point. It says, Which risk do you want? Do you want the risk of having gotten the illness and having to go through it, There's or do you want the risk that comes with the vaccine? It's an individual way. calculation at that point. That's that's the whole argument here is just if it doesn't prevent transmission, there's no group dynamic that you're talking about. Because you're... I, what you don't understand, because I think you don't have healthcare experience, and that's not an insult. It's just, I think, a fact, and I could be wrong, but none of these vaccines listed here, not one of them, prevents transmission or was studied to, to, to do that. So you're asking something that just isn't possible to do. But we take all of these. Every one of us has, has gotten these. Unless you have some crazy parent, we've all gotten this long list of vaccines. Not because we know that they prevent transmission, because that's an impossible task. We know it because most of these, like I couldn't even find for Prevnar. It was a little scary. I couldn't even find a placebo-controlled study. The only, and I couldn't even find an endpoint with clinical outcomes. The only endpoint I could find, which would make you, if you think COVID's bad, look at the Prevnar study. The, every single kid gets Prevnar based on a GMT, geometric mean titer, which is just an antibody response. An antibody response doesn't tell you anything. Maybe those antibodies are no good, right? But for COVID, at least we got clinical outcomes. We're not even getting clinical outcomes for half these things. We're trusting our babies to take these vaccines. And I don't think it's a bad thing, right? But, but if you think the data on COVID is skimpy, holy shit, don't look at pneumococcal or meningococcal vaccines because they're much skimpier. Well, I mean, I'm not familiar with them, and I might have the same objections. But I mean, for MMR, you can just quickly Google yeah, and see if it's. Nobody's going to stop giving vaccines because because you don't know what you're you know you don't know much about this stuff. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, you really don't. I mean, do you think you're you're a healthcare expert? No, I and I've never claimed to be. I, I'm actually literally just reasoning through, and as someone who knows basic math and under understands the gaming you can do with statistics i'm just jaw dropped that you actually find that study compelling and and, and generally just curious to know like what what makes it compelling and you haven't answered that question so i, I don't know why you don't want to answer that question but show you the prep phase three based I, on your why why are we changing subjects like we're talking about covid right i mean i don't know why say, we're changing what i'm trying to illustrate is is your is, is sort of to help map your you're I think you're not answering the question. Can I speak? You have, to, you have to let me finish. To map your astonishment to something that will astonish you 100 times more, because millions of people get the pneumococcal vaccine every year. And if you think the COVID data is weak, you will, be, you will think, based on your approach, which I think I'm kind of grasping, you know, these vaccines are proved on GMT data, no clinical data, no mortality. But they're given and they're standards. So to me, I'm surprised. That's a comparative line of reasoning, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, you're basically saying, hey, hey, dude, look to the right over here. It's worse over there. And that's no, that's no, not I, really I, a valid. I'm that type that, of argument isn't compelling to me is all I mean to say. Which is fine. But what I'm saying is that the, the standards that we use for human health are a lot lower than maybe you think. No, I understand that. And yeah, I've, yep, absolutely. I mean, if you look at some of the things, yeah, no, I, Quite frankly, I definitely like understand. If you in charge of the CDC or the FDA, I don't think. We oh no, no, I I would never want to be a politician because that's what you have to be in public public health. But really, when it comes down, is more bottom up, right? Like each of us has to individually make the right decision. And I think honestly, if I was like a virtuous person trying to give people the best advice, I would tell them to take in all the factors and make their yeah. best judgment based on those factors, you not think, not like mandate it. I think that's the one think, thing you're missing, which is that in public health, it's not psoriasis. You cannot make the individual decision because if you make the individual decision, we don't get her, herd immunity. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't get her, we don't really get anything with this vaccine, right? And that's like that's, that's the whole point of we don't the whole know. point of the study. You went. No, that's not the point of the study, and you're, you're missing exactly what I'm saying for every one of these. 
There was no transmission study. Are you going to get a vaccine against car accidents? Because it would have the same efficacy as the study you posted. And no. you probably have about the same rate of mortality of getting hit by a car you're in the listening. next six months with one in 5,000. So, I mean, it just comes to you're critical not. thinking, right? Like that's the I problem with the schools. So I think, I think the fundamental problem here. Sorry, I had to mute you. I'm, I'm talking right now. Lack of Aaron. OK, I'm going to keep on mute. Um, so for every single one of these vaccines, there's never been a transmission study. What you're requesting doesn't exist. So if you were. I don't vaccine, I don't agree with that. Tell me, show me a transmission phase three. Well, no, no, sorry. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it would be like a phase three, right? It's, it's, you need more time to be able to do something like transmission, right? So, but I mean, if you Google MMR vaccine, is it transmittable? You get a link to the CDC where they explain their position on that. And they believe that it does reduce transmission. Go to, go right? to PubMed and you won't find a single clinical trial that had a primary endpoint with all the alpha allocated towards it that reduced transmission you have no, I'm, I'm, in clinical outcomes yeah you cannot find a phase three you can go on clinicaltrials.gov you can go on pubmed you will not find a phase three that reduced transmission it's not a thing you're you're asking for something that doesn't exist this is why public health is an interesting maybe to you it's something you dislike intensely uh, which is fine you're allowed to do that but this, it's a tricky space because you have to make recommendations. And you said yourself, you wouldn't. Right. Somebody has to take incomplete information and make a call. And the call here was take the COVID vaccine. The call for MMR, which I'm glad they made, the call for polio was take this vaccine. Now, retrospectively, we could look back and say it was the right call. But, you know, you, at the time, they didn't know if this thing was going to reduce, you know, it uh, by 90%. Some of these vaccines, like, uh, certainly the DTAP, you know, the, the HIB and, and things like that uh, for Petrusis and, and, and those things, they didn't reduce it 95%, but we still take them all the time. Tetanus is another, no, but... another one. So like some things you can't really get this great immunity for. So, so it's, it's Mark, basically. Oh. Quick, can I make a quick comment though? Like so you, you mentioned like there's no phase three for transmission and like you can't get a site for transmission. I completely disagree with that. There's a common endpoint called viral load, right? And that's a proxy for, that's a proxy for transmission. So like, for example, if you don't have any of the virus in your body, let's say within 24 hours of getting the vaccine, then your propensity to spread it is reduced compared to having it in your body for a week, right? You could probably agree with that reasoning. It's not necessarily because it depends on a lot of different things, but no, viral load is, is, is a very reasonable you know, very recently. Right. So there's there's viral load. There's also like if the viral load is located somewhere that's like not like, for example, it doesn't end up in your saliva or your sweat or like when you're touching people or your lungs, like as you're coughing, if it ends up like, I don't know, in your shit or something, then like you're not going to you're most likely not going to transfer it. Right. Because people are not going to be handling those fluids. So there are definitely ways you can get you can measure transmission. I, I completely I disagree think, with that point you made. I think the nice thing, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think. The first thing about transmission is getting sick from it, right? And if you're reducing the amount you're getting sick by 95%, that's a great start in recommending a vaccine. Right, right, right. Okay, wait, wait, Martin. Actually, I think this is the crux of our disagreement. So I totally agree with you there because in that story, who was saved? The person who chose to get the vaccine. You, this all originated with using the word selfish. It's selfish that uh, someone doesn't get the vaccine which would imply that other people are impacted by that individual person's decision, which would imply that by getting the vaccine, you reduce the likelihood that you're going to transfer the virus. Correct. And I, I don't think the data bears out that last part, which nope. is why to, to like bring up the original objection, the word selfish, I didn't agree with. You can't get that data is my problem, right? There's no data that exists. I just right? said you do. It's viral load. Just look at viral load. That that to me, like that's convincing to me personally. Like if I was to say, I don't know, you know, if, if you were able to look at like, sorry, would, go ahead. You say, would you say that the 123 people who had clinical symptoms of COVID and the six people in, in a symmetrical group that got clinical symptoms of COVID, which ones had higher viral load? I don't actually know. And like that, that's something that they could have they could have studied, but 
I think like, so Martin, the main thing is if you run out the curves for those two populations, I think the group that got COVID, 123, actually got a better, more efficacious vaccine than those who took whatever this treatment is. I think that's what the data would show. That's another question we can debate, but before we go to that sub question, to have clinical symptoms of of a viral illness, doesn't it stand to reason that you would have more viral load than another group? I mean, if you look at HIV or Hep C or anything like that, like if you don't. I mean, have... intuitively, yes. I'm sure there's some exceptions, but like intuitively, that makes sense. If you're, sure. if you're like, yeah, no, I, I would, I would, I'm sure there's exceptions to that, to be honest. But I think that's why most people looked at this data and said it was a miracle because if if six people out of five thousand got COVID and 123 people out of five thousand got COVID. I'd, I'd rather be in that six group than the 123 group. And it's more likely that I'm, I'm going to have less virus because I have antibodies and the antibodies kick in and they stop the viral load from being high. I think we can get some viral load data, to be honest. But again, th- it's a lot of data that, that's out there that most people who have who want to talk about this, and I commend you for, for sort of looking at data and thinking about it and trying to come up with, with, with thinking uh, and reasoning, most people just don't even don't even want to look at this stuff, right? They just want to dismiss it and hand wave, and, and largely it's become sort of, as I said, a political uh, football uh, more than it is uh, a data football. So I think it's 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 a good thing. That well, want- it's not. And the, the, just the bottom line is half of Americans can't even do a fraction. So like, there's there's just some baseline mathematical literacy that doesn't exist, where it's unfortunately impossible for anyone to actually like the average person just can't critically think. I think the whatever that guy's name was, he like really reveals that like the average person just has to work off pattern recognition and what they're told. Whereas like folks like you and I, I mean, it sounds like, you know, some statistics. I mean, I, I, I really in good faith couldn't be like marching on these talking points when I know good and well, what is charlatan science and what is legitimate study or, or rather what is a legitimately resounding conclusion of a study. And I mean, looking at this study, this is, this is not like a strong case for, taking the vaccine. And that's, I mean, that's my critical thinking. Like I could be, you know, you, we can disagree. I totally see where you're coming from. I think the only real difference between you and I is how much faith we put in that committee that you mentioned. This is like A2C or whatever the hell it was called. Um, I put zero stock in that, but, but that's, most people wouldn't do that. Most people would actually put a lot of stock in that. Um, I put zero in that. So that's, that's probably why my reasoning is a little bit different. Well, I think when you have a child, you might put more stock in it than you think. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the really like, man, it would suck to be like if I was, if I had kids fifty years ago, and they were first rolling out those vaccines, I would literally be in a huge quandary because yeah, I would demand probably the same level of evidence, but it wouldn't exist. So I, I'm just I'm very blessed that a lot of these mandated vaccines actually have decades of data that implicitly show that people aren't dying. So that's I'm super lucky in that regard. But I do have the same challenge that you'll have, which is. Do you administer a novel vaccine to a child? And I just hope everyone has some level of reflexive skepticism to that, especially for novel delivery mechanisms like the mononuclease, or sorry, the, the monolipid delivery. I mean, you mentioned that those are supposed to be gone within a month, but they're finding them in people's brains and livers. Like, anyway, as long as we should all be like a little bit skeptical and like paying attention to the results and not, and not listening to committees is, is my only like conclusion. I, I disagree because of what you said earlier about about the fractions thing that, you know, I think if a pediatrician says this is what I recommend for your child, that you should do it and not question the pediatrician because Joe Rogan told you to or not. You know, I think, you know, it's it's what's made our country's healthcare system so great. I do, do want to point to you this quick abstract, which is just an abstract, but uh, uh, of this study, I haven't read the study and and, you know, I don't know if it's reasonable or not, but there was a, they did a PCR nucleic acid test of, you know, a, a viral load and they saw a 2.4 log reduction, which as you know, is a 200 fold reduction. So it's a 99, probably a 99.5% reduction in viral load compared to vaccination. Well, oh, so, sorry, not interrupt, but just keep in mind, those are logarithmic for a reason, right? Like when, when you run those tests to detect viral load, they're very fuzzy because they're doing PCR, right? Polymerase chain reaction. They're, they're looking for basically a binary response in that type oh, of a test. Either, 
Viral load's quantitative PCR. It's not. It's no, no, not it's like, it's quantitative. But I'm just saying, like, it's an exponent. You're taking a time. You're taking a snapshot of an exponential, an exponentially unfolding function, right? So if you take it plus or minus like one second, you've literally doubled. So it's there's probably a, I would imagine a high standard deviation on this. Well, if you have a 99.5 percent delta, I mean. <laughs> no, but but that you, you don't use a percentage when you're talking about a log scale. Like li literally, as you probably understand, like each gradation on a log scale is a 10x change. Now, here's here's the funny part is that if you look at the log viral load, you're looking at seven versus nine and a half, and there is a a, a large error bar. Yeah, I mean, this is making my point, right? The the error bars are longer than the effect size. So, but anyway, I mean, Martin, I'll be, I'll be willing to admit that maybe there is some difference in viral load. I'd be interested in knowing what the, what, so the chart I would like to look at is yeah, I don't, viral. I don't think, to be honest, I don't think this chart would, to me, if I, I saw it, several, seven, <laughs> seven logs versus eight logs, you still have a ton of infectious particles in, in your bloodstream one way or the other. I don't know what the minimum threshold for transmission is, but I'm willing to kind of agree with what you just said. But I guess the question is, what is the time stamp on this, right? So from the start of, I guess it'd be what, the onset of symptoms or something? Which that's the other challenge with COVID is like people were most infectious when they weren't symptomatic as well. It's also counterintuitive because you'd expect like when someone's coughing or getting congested or has like mucus, that's when they'd be the most infectious, but that's not the case of COVID. So there's a lot of counterintuitive things there, but did, does it say like how many days or how, how long after? I think the general argument can be summarized that, that you're uncomfortable with this syllogism that others are more comfortable with. And it's, it's actually, yeah. you know, sort of summarized here in one sentence, pretty good. Since viral load is linked to transmission, single dose mRNA COVID-19 vaccination may help control outbreaks. Um, you know, and this, again, this is a nursing home setting. You know, I think that that syllogism, again, is, is something that you have to come to terms with, not use. Oh, wow. So there's, wait, but that, sorry, that's a nursing home setting? Yeah. Oh, man. See, that's a bummer because like, like I said earlier, obviously the, the strongest signal in this, in the data for COVID is being above 65, right? If you're above 65, you absolutely need to take the vaccine immediately. Like you, you are rolling the dice if you don't take the vaccine and you're that old. My, my only objection is below 65, where I think it, I think the effect is not worth introducing the exogenous risk. But yeah, if you're looking at just old people, like, holy shit, absolutely. All of the data shows that old people are saved by the shit. So. Okay. Not, not what I thought you would say. But I, no, I said that like an hour ago. Like, if if you're above sixty five, your mortality rate for getting COVID is humongous. Like, you definitely should take the vaccine if you're sixty five or older. To be fair, it's still not humongous. It's just larger than. Sort of oh no! It's like to get the one percent average that you're talking about. It's a super right leaning distribution. Like yeah, the, the actual for people below thirty, it's like a one in a hundred thousand. It's extremely rare. But all, so, how do you get a one percent average? No, I've seen the data. Here. It's just still relatively. It's, it's oh, it is like I've never seen like a more skewed. That's a completely right. It's very skewed. The, it, the mortality yeah. doesn't get to like fifty percent or something. It's not that high. I mean, it's still. Oh yeah, not fifty percent, but it, it does get close to like the three percent. That was actually kind of scary. Like when COVID was first emerging in March, we got data from China showing ten percent mortality rate. Like, imagine if it actually played out like that. And those, you know, the age effect wasn't really well known at that time. So, I mean, at that point, it's like fucking lock everything down. Everyone should just fill. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, by the time it was June 2020, we had a lot more age-related data that really showed that it's very age-dependent for the mortality endpoint, which is the one that I think is most important. There's not really any other outcome of COVID that I think is particularly scary than death. It's the hardest to study is the problem. As I mentioned, we have this problem in breast cancer, prostate cancer, all these cancers that now have gone treatable. We, we can't prove mortality oh, anymore. It's can that, I, mean, I differ with you on that? Like all, all it would take to study that, Martin, is have a mandate that every hospital needs to publish the age of anyone who died of COVID. 
and put it in the national database. Oh, Boom. Yeah. Then you've got the curve. The FDA and, and everybody likes a priori controlled studies with protocols that are executed, you know, in a prospective manner that's, that adjusts for well, control. You, sorry, but Martin, you only need that for defining a treatment, right? But I'm saying before you, you're not trying to understand a treatment yet. You're just trying to understand the phenomenological properties of the illness. You're trying to understand what is the current state of this illness. Well, you have to do that while you're also trying to design treatments and vaccines, right? So it's very hard to do. And I think given the sort of fire that had to be put out, uh, everyone rose to the occasion. And unfortunately, I think everyone but the American public, to be frank. Um, and I know that's sort of an unpopular thing to say. But again, I, I, I don't think 99% of us when you know, we can all talk tough, but when we have kids and many of us have had kids at the end of the day, you're giving your kid the MMR shot. You're giving your kid the Petrusis shot. You're giving your kid the, the hip shot, the diphtheria shot. You're giving them all because at the end of the Correct. day, you're going to trust the doctor. And, and I think that, you know, I'm thankful that is to be frank, because otherwise we would, we would have a society full of measles, mumps and rubella. Sanofi's six in one vaccine. This is Sanofi's brand new six in one vaccine. It is literally a year old. Everyone's going to take it. You're right, but at the same time, like Prevnar 20. Prevnar builds on Prevnar 17, like in many ways. No, it was, yeah. But regardless, the the point is that, you know, GMT, um, they said, well, the GMT is enough. That's going to give you the coverage. And they were right. I've seen GMT this be misleading before. Hence, you know, again, I'm a skeptic. Uh, GMT does not necessarily translate to efficacy and prevention, prophylactic prevention. And we've seen it be misleading in the past. So when those results came out, it really was, you know, until you get, like you said, <laughs> 10 years from now, you get amount of COVID-19 dropping dramatically, uh, then, you know, that's the only way you could really prove uh, that it's the case. Now, the problem is diseases do go away. For example, polio, had several years where there was just quiet polio season. And people said, oh, maybe polio will just disappear, and then it would come back. And the only way to really determine whether or not the polio vaccine would be efficacious was to do a trial, not to just give it to everyone and say, well, we'll see what happens based on how many people get it or don't get it, right? Like, it's it's very hard to, and, and as a statistician, I'm sort of surprised that, that you would advocate looking at sort of population level data that's not controlled and, and inferring kind of that the vaccine worked or didn't work because it's not a great, you know, way, as you know, logically. To Sorry, when, when did I say that? I didn't say that. Well, I think you said that you, you like the, the long-term track record of the MMR vaccine. I think there's a lot of meaning in that. I think that's actually one of the strongest above the FDA's approval, above a committee, above any six month study. The exactly. proof in the pudding of a, of a multi-decade vaccine, that, that's probably, honestly, that's analogous to like a law of physics that's been reproduced over many years. Like it, that's the most analogous evidence I think you can ever get for a vaccine. It's nice to see it works, but, but remember that you can't infer causality. No, no, but that's but that's the thing. You actually don't even need that, right? You all you need to know is what is the actual output, what is the effect change in the population? You know, we right? don't know if that populate if that measles MMR has dropped ninety five percent because MMR just died out. The same. Well, we we do we do know something. Sorry, we, we do know one thing, right? We know what the occurrence rate of MMR was before the invention of the vaccine. But we don't so, know, for example, swine flu just went away on its own. Bird flu went away on its own. Yellow fever went away on its own, right? They didn't become 
these crazy pandemics. Well, because, flu, I mean, flus are, yeah, I mean, flus are just, they rotate to endemic, right? Just like COVID is essentially doing. There's been other illnesses like that. And, and the point is like, you know, these things do wax and wane. And sometimes it's a result of sanitation. Sometimes it's a result of hygiene. Sometimes it's a result of other things. And, you know, in this case, um, we can't for sure say it was the vaccine. Now, I think we can because they did clinical trials. And the clinical trials, again, they're suggestive. They're not proof positive. And, and my larger point is it's because you can't do a half the country gets the vaccine, half the country doesn't. Um, you know, it ultimately... Absolutely, yeah. You know, as you can see, like even people who get who get the vaccine get COVID. And the reason for that, as you may know, is that you can make a conformational, you know, spike protein. This is what my drug-like software is designed to study. Uh, you know, these these 3D structures of of the uh, talk my own stuff for a second here. Um, <laughs> you put, put the 3D structure of, of the spike protein in here, you can make a vaccine. I actually designed a drug that fits right in the middle there, so it stops the protein from working, but the, you can make up a, 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 an antibody response to this surface protein, right? But ultimately, all it has to do is wiggle out of it, change a little bit, and your protein is not gonna look like this. You know, uh, your protein may look slightly different, your antibody may look slightly different, and those four, okay. six bastards that, you know, st got this vaccine and still got COVID, you know, it just didn't work out for them, right? The rest of, of them, though, the 95%, it did. But the 5% that got it anyway, you know, it's just going to happen. So would you rather live in a world where, all right, you know that no vaccine is going to be perfect, but, you know, would you rather live in a world where, where you know, you do seem to be getting this enormous benefit? Um, you know, to me, it's, like I said, it's, it's a no-brainer, and that's why, what? I mean, listen, this is the greatest pharmaceutical product ever sold, right? I mean, the market voted with its feet and the market, a lot of people took this thing, right? Uh, I'm not saying that makes you wrong, but I'm saying, because it doesn't, but I am saying that, you know, it is not some like idiotic, you know, thing. And I'm not saying the, 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 the madness of the markets makes me right or makes me smart, but it, it it would be weird to think that, you know, this is a gigantically foolish thing when I think, you know, billion, over a billion people have taken uh, this product. I don't think the market was forced to take it necessarily, but I understand what you're saying. I mean, they tried to, well, I mean, it is interesting. There was a lot of governmental thumb on the scale. I, mean, I remember talking to a, a lady, she was a hospital admin. She's like maybe in her 60s. And uh, she just retired early because they were going to mandate her to take the vaccine. She felt that her prior infection from COVID gave her superior immunity. And, you know, at the time, that wasn't really the, the feeling du jour of Fauci and these various medical boards. And so she actually ended up retiring off of that. And, you know, I think that's a really common story. Like, I think a lot of old people were forced into retirement because they felt that their native, vac their native vaccine from nature if you want was that, sufficient. I think it's, it's a completely insane because... Again, if you look at the ASIP schedule, you know, were you the, you know, six month old sitting crying saying, no, mama, don't give me all these vaccines. Like it's, it's such a crazy thing to me that here you have this, again, there's, the, there's literally, you know, there's a long list of every single vaccine and what ASIP says to do. And 99% of us, you know, here's a PDF. This is the current standard for HEP A. Okay. You got your HEP A, HEP A results and all this recommendations, like, you have to kind of trust somebody to do the work here the same way I trust the plumber or anybody else to do the work when I uh, need help for something that I don't know anything about. And even for this, where I know a lot about, I'm not sitting there think reading this shit. Like I just trust the pediatrician. When I have a kid, I'm not going to sit there. and. Well, cry. yeah, I think it comes down to your point about what do you expect of the average person? I mean, the best example that comes to mind is like a car mechanic, right? If you don't want to learn how to how to change your own oil or how, how your car works or how to tell if you're getting police, then yeah, your your only alternative is to have the car mechanic do the work on your car. But of course, like the reputation of car mechanics is they fleece you, right? They take advantage of the fact that you don't know what you're talking about and they can jack up the prices and they can just tell you, oh yeah, you need to change the coolant here and they just upcharge you, right? But if you if you want to aspire to like the highest level of control so that you can live in the world and have the best decision. You learn how to you learn how a car works and you learn how to maintain your car yourself right and so i think it's the same thing with vaccines you should 
if, if you're going to do no work, then yeah, copy and paste what everyone else is saying and take, take the hit that you're going to get, which is not in, incorporating the factors that you have that are unique to you, right? But I think everyone should aspire to say, where am I located in the demographic distribution? What are my unique input factors? And how does that correlate with my risk for this illness? Yeah, right. of course, I disagree with that. But again, you have, you have this. I mean, you're not walking around with like long-term oxygen therapy mask on because you know that you don't have an SVO2 below 90%, right? Like you're not going to just do that because you know based on your own data that you're not susceptible to losing oxygen to your brain. So yeah. you, I, I otherwise, just, why are you not taking every medicine at the same time? I, I disagree with, with where you're coming from. That's why I got the vaccine. Um, even at my young age. Uh, but again, you know, you have these vaccines that are given to babies two, four, and six months. So you have adults worried about nanograms, literally nanograms of mRNA. And there, there, there are people who, you know, again, uh, this RNA is not going to last forever. Nucleic acids are extremely fragile. That's why I didn't think these things would work anyway. Um, but of course they did. Uh, but the, the amount of actual mRNA that's, that's given to you is, is so minuscule. It's, it's remarkable. There's even an immune response, if you ask me. And, um, you know, to me, I, again, like this is, is just shocking that a 30 year old person or something like that would be so adverse to such a small amount of mRNA, uh, whereas, you know, which is almost certainly gone within 24 hours, right? Like mRNA just isn't going to last that long. There's, you know, I'm curious if there's pharmacokinetics. Well, I think the question is the delivery mechanism, right? Um, like that's, that's one of the novel things is the well, monolithic. I think that in PK, the amount given, it matters a lot because you can assume that 100% <laughs> of the amount gets to the target site and you're still sort of dealing with, you know, I, I just, there are not many drugs that are, measured in nanograms. You know, it's, it's a remarkably small amount. Um, I'm trying to see if there's a good PK study. So why aren't you getting a booster? Uh, why? Uh... What's wrong with the regular stuff? Whoever was just talking, I think you cut out. I don't, I don't think we heard what you said. I said what's wrong with the regular stuff. And I was saying uh, just regular old dead virus vaccine. Why, why are we not doing that? Because the thing about RNA, it's, it's, all, it's very specific. Very specific. It wasn't as effective. The AstraZeneca vaccine was like 80% effective. It wasn't... Uh... Oh. I like how it says pharmacokinetics, not applicable. Because <laughs> it's such a, I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's a little crazy, but it's such a small amount of medicine that you, you almost can't even track it. Um, yeah, that's a strange detail to fix it on, my opinion, because, I mean, there's so many things in the body that, in, in any absolute terms, is extremely small, but can have a huge impact. Like, yes, but I, not, a, not RNA. You know, it, it's, it's well. It's, not, yeah, no, I I don't think the mRNA is really the concern. It's it's the micro lipids that they're using to deliver it, right? Yeah, the lipid nanoparticle is 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 not a whole lot different from having a a, a Big Mac. I mean, it's it's just a micelle, right? It's it's. Oh, I would totally micelle. disagree with that. I mean, it, it's a it's it's a manufactured exogenous delivery of. I mean, oh yeah, I'm surprised you compared to a hamburger, like. It's being There's delivered in a totally different. It doesn't go through your stomach, man. Like cells are made of this stuff. Like lipid, my um, let's see, lipid nanoparticle. Uh, uh, yeah, no, yeah, manufactured doesn't really mean anything. But uh, isn't the issue here is that yeah, it's just, so just strain specific? What these uh, these LNPs have been given chronically in other clinical contexts for a long period of time, and and again, they're these are like. The types of molecules that are well understood in terms of like how micelles and things like that and how how they're in liposomes specifically 
how they're how they sort of um, dissipate in the body and how they're metabolized and stuff like that. So liposomes are are an old invention for an L LMPs as well, or an older invention, and that's why like uh, people in my my seat, uh, fund managers and stuff like that that follow this stuff, we we all kind of laughed that they would take because you know the basic problem with with RNA in general and DNA in general is that they're charged molecules, and these charged molecules, the cellular sort of uh, lipid bilayer. This is the, sort of the drug, the drug industry's bane of existence is that every cell has this lipophilic layer. It's very hard to penetrate into this unless you have a lipophilic agent. And that's why for drugs, you want to have this log P, which is a, a partition coefficient that uh, uh, determines, you know, just basically tells you how fatty or how polar, nonpolar or polar something is. If something's too polar and DNA is very, very polar, literally de deoxyribonucleic acid, it's not going to go in. And so the skepticism of people like me was, well, how, this, how is this shit? Make all that mRNA you want, Moderna. How is this stuff going to go into the cell? It's not going to get in. And they said, oh, we got a solution for that. We're going to use li lipid nanoparticles. And we all burst out laughing like that, uh, you know, meme uh, uh, with Bush and Ray. Yeah. Um, because... Right, it's like, and then they said they're going to use lipid nanoparticles, and and the reality is is that it's funny that it worked because lipids, you know, traffic to the liver, it wouldn't work for any other cell cell system. But lipids, uh, the LDL receptor, is expressed uh, on liver cells, literally a liver, right? And these LDL receptors will take in those those lipid particles uh, because it's like I said, cholesterol. It's like a Big Mac. These are literally uh, low density like a protein and they take them in shockingly, but the liver likes to take things in. That's why it's, it's easier to, to target things to the liver because the liver loves to take medicine in. That's why for the hep C drugs, even though they're very uh, polar, they still will get in uh, because the liver is just sort of this magnet for this stuff. And so anyway, the, the lipoprotein enters the liver, the lipoprotein eventually sort of dissembles, the mRNA is released, the target protein is made, the antigen, is get it's an antigen response and, and the rest is history. You get immunity. So to me, like, again, this, this is like not scary biology. Like there's nothing to be scared of here. It's, it's just funny that they use this age old technology. The first liposomes, uh, in, in medicine were, were used, uh, you know, uh, I want to say decades and decades ago. And so these liposomes are spherical bilayers from 50 to 100 nan uh, thousand nanometers. And again, they were used in, uh, they're used right now in uh, drugs like uh, in Vega Sistena, which is uh, uh, in, in, uh, an injection for schizophrenics. They're used in a, a drug called Ambazome, which is a, a lipophilic uh, injection for an antifungal. Uh, again, phospholipid bilayer, very traditional, simple thing. They're used in a drug called Doxel. Um, if anybody thinks I don't know a lot about medicine, I think hopefully this is <laughs> told you. <laughs> I, I know almost every single FDA approved drug uh, and, and how they work and things like that. But Doxel is another, again, liposome that you, you, you know, so compartmentalizing these drugs in these, in these liposomes is not something that's new. Um, one of the things you might be scared of, which freaked me out, is the uridine uh, substitute in these vaccines. Uh, and this the what thing, substitute? So, so uridine is is uh, one of the. I know ones. uridine. Okay, I was just one. I didn't hear. It okay, go on. Never mind. They made something, and I hope I don't cause any conspiracies here. Conspiracies here, but this freaked me out. They changed the uridine, which is the uridine our body sees, right? It's the instead of ACTG, it's a uh, AUCG. So the uridine replaces oh. in DNA and RNA. It's uh, in DNA. It's ATCG. In RNA, it's AUCG. They took out the uridine and put in pseudouridine, which, you know, is really, really scary because this is not the RNA base that the body normally sees. And in fact, this is less immunogenic. So, so if, so I guess the body can, can tell whether or not, you know, foreign DNA particles have entered or foreign RNA particles have entered and it tends to destroy them. Here, like the pseudouridine is a little more resistant to that destruction and it's a really remarkable thing that, you know, they change the actual MR, the actual RNA. This isn't natural RNA, which is very 
very, very sort of strange to me. That's probably well, uh, yeah. Why did they do it? Well, I think most people say it was for metabolism reasons, and then some people say it was for immunogenicity. So I think there's um, that argument is still sort of wait, but um, LKK, why would you care? Because earlier you said you don't care if it's manufactured or not. So why why would this matter to you? Because that's the big fucking point, you idiot. Whether it's the natural form or not. Oh, Wait, okay. Don't. So, it, so it does matter if it's manufactured? If it's the natural form, it's not an issue. But if it's not, that's a big deal. Everything that's now, exogenous... Now be quiet, be quiet, you idiot, and let the man talk. Okay, so... Uh, can, can you repeat what, what uh, why they did it can exactly? You it? So, so you have to... Ick it, it, it has a special sense of humor. You gotta take it with a grain of salt. So they changed it... And I didn't know they changed it actually for, for months. And I don't think most people knew they changed it for months. They said it's just mRNA, but it's not. Technically, it's a slightly different base pair, which looks sort of like you could say it's like alien RNA or like alien DNA. Like it's not, it's very weird to me. Now, medicine has done this. If you look at the, the uh, so-called antisense drugs, these drugs are, are based on sort of new technologies that allow like these, these very different... Uh, um, chemistries where they take DNA, but they slightly change the base pairs so that they, they don't exactly overlap. Here's a good example of constraining and changing the, the base pairs uh, with slightly unnatural substitutions so that it's less resistant to nucleases. Nucleases, as you can tell from the name, they, they chop up these nucleic acids. Um, and, and that's your enemy if you're trying to deliver an RNA or DNA-based drug, right? You don't want the body to do what it's supposed to do, which is it has all these nucleases in the bloodstream because if some random DNA is in your blood, chances are it's not yours, right? It's some foreign invader. And that's uh -huh. why the body is chock full of nucleases. In fact, in rats and mice, we have a lot of problems in medicine doing animal studies with rats and mice because they have a nuclease level that is so pumped up. Rats can survive anything be for that reason. Their nuclease activity is like 100 times that of humans because they're so used to being poisoned and stuff like that, that they have this massive uh, enzymatic activity in the periphery. So even humans have that, like I said. So if you have nucleic acids swimming around your bloodstream, it's chances are they're not leaking out of you, you know, uh, your cells. So there, there's something trying to come in, usually a virus. So the nucleases sit around chopping this stuff up. So to make DNA-based medicine, uh, drug companies have had to design these unnatural uh, drugs. And again, in the cases that uh, rare diseases and severe uh, lethal illnesses, you sort of take that risk. But for this, you're sort of designing an unnatural uh, nucleic acid uh, for millions of people or billions of people to take, which to me kind of took me by surprise. And again, all sort of well that ends well, but these things still don't have, like I said, you're talking about micrograms, nanogram level of, of medicine, which is, you know, I mean, if, you're, if you could see the amount that this is, right, that a, a, a microgram or 30 micrograms of a, uh, actually is, I think you'd laugh and say, what am I scared of? 30 micrograms of, of this like very flimsy molecule. It, it, it's now I understand, look, 30 molecules, 30 milligram, uh, micrograms of cyanide will kill you. So, you know, it's not like some simple analysis. Yeah, I'm not compelled by the absolute scale, but, but yeah. It's still a remarkably small amount. I mean, people will take 30, 30 literally 30 milligrams of, of something they are told is cocaine. And, and say that they don't want to take 30 nanograms or micrograms of the vaccine, um, you know, which is a thousandth uh, less the amount and will has a pharmacokinetic characteristics that are far safer. Uh, again, I'm not saying everybody's sitting there taking cocaine, but uh, I'm saying that, you know, this is a, you know, probably, a, you know, one millionth, one one millionth the risk of, of something like taking uh, well, well, I mean, isn't you know, having such a tiny amount has its its own risk in a certain way like for example with amphetamines if you take a really tiny dose you you get uh, uh what uh, i don't remember what what's it called but you uh you ba basically start getting uh the the symptoms that you would have in a very high dose okay if it's like 0. 0.2 milligrams instead of uh 20 milligrams uh, Fair, to see inverse dose responses. And I think they're usually like more, more fictional than anything else, but 
<clears throat> the point I've experienced them. Uh, I saw it firsthand. It's, but there's a lot of anec- anecdotes or anecdotes, though, and and uh, I think in in medicine, my experience has been the more you give something, the the more the side effects are. Not, you know, but that's again, you know, I've seen my fair share of inverse dose responses that are are sometimes unexplainable. But um, anyway, the point is this: this is a really small amount of medicine. What's interesting is ten micrograms here in these GMTs. You get the same GMT. Um, they still give 30, I think, as the clinical dose. But regardless, I think um, they have a really, really, really small amount of medicine. Um, uh, so anyway, um, um, I, I think like I don't think it's trivial that it's that it's 10 micrograms. I mean, it, again, you know, not all of the drug makes it, you know, when you get injected in a, in a intramuscular injection, you're not still not dealing with a hundred percent bioavailability because you're, you're, you do lose some to the periphery. Um, I don't know what percentage actually does get converted to protein, but it's not a hundred percent needless to say. And again, I would look at like how th- there had been studies of LNPs and how they get distributed and broken down and stuff like that. And it, it's not something too new to science. Again, I think at the end of the day, like one of the things that makes a lot of people uncomfortable is just the clinical trial process in general and and how new and crazy some of this stuff is and how it feels like a guinea pig process. And there are unanswered questions. And, you know, it's certainly something that more people are learning that a lot is just taken and, and sort of given a chance and given to sort of hopes and, and, expectations that may or may not come true. For example, as I said, measles, mumps, rubella has declined dramatically. Diphtheria has it. Tetanus has it. We get vaccinated for all that shit, but that stuff has not disappeared, despite, quote unquote, herd immunity, despite the lack of a host, theoretically. A lot of that stuff hasn't changed. And sometimes we Are you talking about globally or in the U.S.? Either way. And and sometimes we know why and sometimes we don't. Because, as you can imagine, with all the covariates that exist with this stuff, it's hard to know exactly why you know, we're, we're getting immune to something and why we aren't. Polio was a great outcome. MMR, great outcome. But, you know, we still get tons of pneumococcal disease, even though we shove Prevnar in every single person. <laughs> Pfizer is trying to shove it in every person alive, let alone uh, kids, uh, adults get it too now. And it's not really work, you know, it's still get pneumonia. How can you get vaccinated for tetanus? It's like getting vaccinated for rabies. It's too complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, rabies doesn't have a prophylactic vaccine, uh, but the te- tetanus is something you can train your immune system for and, and get, uh, basically get, uh, you know, uh, immunity to, right? So the, the goal is that when you actually get infected that you don't die from it or whatever. Um, oh. I, think, I think rabies may, may, maybe does have a prophylactic vaccine, but I'm not a vaccine expert. It's always been the backwater. I think it's vaccine. actually only, isn't it only prophylactic? Or like like within, you know, ten ten minutes or ten sorry within like five hours of getting bit, you you have to administer that vaccine or otherwise like a hundred percent mortality. Yeah, it's a very weird situation with with rabies, but I, I actually think there's a there's a so I I, I tried to I, I looked at this briefly because I wanted to buy buy the vaccine and raise the price of it um, for rabies. Uh, it's it. I don't think there's a birth vaccine that's prophylactic. But you're right about the, the treatment is is very weird. It's it's a vaccine where you try to raise an immune response just in time, which is a very bizarre way to to do it, right? Um, and then there's an antitoxin, I think, but it doesn't work. So like I've, I've thought about how to like make the situation for rabies a little better uh, because there isn't much innovation in that space. Um, it wasn't just a cash grab. It was also how do we fix this so that you know there's more therapeutic options available. For example, why aren't there rabies sort of more effective rabies medicines than just, you know, uh, you have this window and you're dead unless, you know, you hit this window. And part of the reason is, as I've said many times, there's kind of this broken pharma system where it's like, well, if there's no incentive, nobody's going to innovate. And it's like, well, I can manufacture artificial incentive uh, by raising price. I can have this big profit pool and then I can do the right thing with that profit pool and, and create my own incentive. Uh, which again is sort of what's happening with a lot of these uh, markets uh, that we've seen over the years where uh, Pfizer and Merck need to be convinced that they should do R&D in the space. The only way they can be convinced is if the space is making 
millions or billions of dollars, usually billions. So it's just a funny kind of like, you know, dynamic where, you know, there's just a lot of uh, uh, sleepiness unless there's, you know, a reason to Profit incentive, yeah. Which is, is unfortunate, you know, but it's, it's, it, it worked. I saw it work really well with MS where the entire farm industry thought MS was a joke, that there's no way they can make money in multiple sclerosis. And then Biogen came out with this terrible drug. It was, it was really awful for MS, but it was the only drug for MS. And it started selling $3 billion. And everyone at Novartis and Merck said, what? $3 billion? Gee, we could use a new $3 billion drug. Like our drugs sell one or $2 billion, uh, occasionally a little more. But we, we, we're interested in MS now. You know, that's, that's a wake-up call. And, and they started making MS drugs. And, and who benefited from all this? MS patients. There are now 12 MS drugs, and, and each one is better than the last because every drug company tried to outdo the, each other. And now, you know, some of those drugs are generic and, and cheap, like Tecfidera is now really cheap. Um, it used to be thirty dollars or $40,000. Now it's like 500 bucks. And Tecfidera reduces your MS activity by 80 or 90%. The original Biogen MS drug was about a 50% reduction. So thanks to the incentives, you have this sort of miracle for MS patients, including uh, my friend Pedro is a hedge fund manager in Brazil, who takes uh, Tecfidera and some other MS medicines. Um, and, you know, uh, just a really great thing for people with MS. And of course, there have been people with MS who didn't get Tecfidera because they were born before Biogen or whatever, and they uh, were disabled from that disease. So I think if you had to ask yourself, you know, then this is, of course, my pitch to America, that, you know, which is better, a, a country with MS or a country with uh, MS, uh, you know, it's the easy answer. You know, there's no doubt about it. We should be giving medals to the people who, who created that incentive structure and, and enforced it to make a great new medicine. So, you know, people don't see it that way for a litany of reasons that over time, I, and I had about four, four and a half years to really think about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a number of reasons why people don't see it that way. And I, I better understand them now than I did before this whole odyssey started, but I still will, will always advocate for pharma innovation. And you know, the COVID vaccine isn't perfect. There's no doubt about it. I, and I, I, I do wish we learned more about this stuff. But I think that, that really the industry did the best it could. And uh, short of doing a million Absolutely. person clinical trial. Yeah, I, I think doing a, a million person clinical trial and giving everyone a nucleic acid test where you could actually see the viral load, that is actually one of the, my biggest questions was where's the viral load? Are these people actually seeing reductions in, in the amount of virus that is in their system. And that was not systematically tested. The only thing that was tested was, did you get COVID or not? Which is far from a objective. I mean, yeah. it's somewhat, you know, but it, it's, it's not what you would have preferred. And, and in, I mean, I have a slightly cynical take there that like the reason that wasn't really, I'm sure the magnifying glass would have been put on that if it, the data was a little better. And I, but I don't think there's like, there's people that think this vaccine was like, manufactured to be a mind control thing or th that's complete garbage like people put their best foot forward with this we're lucky that it is it does what it does but i just i guess the only nuance that i want to communicate is it's not it has its downsides it could have been better there are some downsides to it that are not it's no fault of a human like it's just purely the way the chips fell um and like we should just be kind of careful about like indiscriminately applying it but I think the healthiest thing is is a is skepticism. I mean, as I mentioned, I didn't mention the the, the short sales I've done over the years to to you know gloat or to 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 do anything like that. I I, I mentioned it one to establish my legitimacy as an analyst, um, which at least on Wall Street is is very much on question. But I also did it because I mentioned that for for many years I was considered the like doom and gloom guy, like the guy who was the most cynical, the most uh, skeptical, the most like the guy who, when, when I called your drug company, it's a bad thing. <laughs> you know, your stock is probably about to go down. If I'm nosing around your drug company, figuring out what the, what the problem is with your therapy, it's not a good sign. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of the death knell for, uh, for many of these drug companies that have, that, that show clinical trial data that's misleading. Uh, I have a really, really good uh, presentation that I gave to uh, the FDA. Uh, for this drug called Lorcaserin. This was one of my most proudest moments, and nobody really even knows the story. Um, Lorcaserin was the drug that the FDA approved for obesity, and I begged the FDA not to do it. Um, I was so 
upset that they approved the drug. I showed them that this chemical structure is, is, is very dangerous. I showed them that in preclinical studies that the drug caused uh, uh, tumors, it caused uh, hallucinations, it caused a huge number of problems. They approved the drug anyway. Oh, by the way, this is an obesity drug and it only loses about two or 3% of your weight. Whereas, you know, the medicines we have for obesity now are looking at 10, 15, 20% weight loss. So you had no benefit, right? And I wrote the FDA this long paper and they approved it anyway. And guess what happened? Two or three years later, it was pulled from the market, you know, and, and this whole thing could have been avoided. And I was a, a deep skeptic about this stuff, but they, they still let it go. And it was a pretty ugly thing. Then uh, there was a company called Mankind, which made an inhaled insulin, right? Just Google my name on this thing. And, and you'll see that there's this big conspiracy that I stopped this company from getting FDA um, uh, from getting FDA uh, approved. Uh, and so basically, um, I sort of, uh, the, the CEO who passed away, um, this is my, uh, my paper I sent to the FDA. So this is a private paper. And I sent uh, this, I, I, so a CRL means a non-approval. This would have been a crushing, crushing blow for mankind. So I said this to the FDA on Christmas. Uh, roughly. And I said that, you know, you really should not approve uh, this drug. And I showed all the, you know, reasons why I said, this is misleading, uh, you know, allegedly the same, you know, this discrepancy, uh, you know, all this stuff where I, I like, like an investigative reporter, I, I went through all of this and I said, take a look here. I said, the FTA holds a high standard for formulation changes. They should not, uh, you know, uh, go easy on this company that was, uh, you know, trying to uh, um, get this approval of this uh, inhaled insulin. I thought it would be very dangerous for people to inhale this stuff because there was not clear uh, that, uh, you know, that this, this drug worked. So amazingly, the FDA changed its mind. Uh, they decided to, after reading this, they decided to uh, uh, deny mankind FDA approval, which was really surprising. And the reason I know this is there was an insider trader who was prosecuted at the FDA and he bet on every single FDA outcome because he knew what was going to happen. He was worked at the FDA. He would just look at the network and he actually knew if drugs would get approved before uh, they got approved. And he was long mankind. So he was actually bullish on the company. Uh, and then uh, he decided to sell his stock in the company and go short <laughs> right around the time of my uh, letter, which is really funny because... Uh, you know, uh, they decided to uh, not approve it. The stock fell 90% and I made a fortune. Eventually the drug got approved. Um, the CEO of Mankind was this billionaire named Al Mann. Uh, he named the company after himself. Mankind is M-A-N-N, -N. Al Mann is M-A-N-N. -N. And Al Mann tried to fight me. Uh, he was 80 years old. And we went to this JP Morgan conference and uh, I was there with uh, my colleague Marek and Andre, Andre and I, I I waved uh, this letter I had and all this stuff, and, and I started antagonizing him in, in public. And he actually got in my face, 82-year-old guy at the time, I'm 28, and he, he starts cursing at me, and we had to be separated by, uh, by, um, by security. And it was a really just a, just a really, really crazy time, but Al lost that round. Uh, he would end up putting over $2 billion of his net worth, virtually his entire net worth. Al was one of the greatest entrepreneurs in our country's history. But he kind of lost his mind towards the end of his career. Um, Al invented, uh, in a lot of ways, the cochlear implant for deaf people. He also invented the diabetes pump for, for diabetics. So this guy changed the face of medicine. But he also wanted to change uh, insulin by, by making it inhaled and thus much more convenient. The problem with Al was up against is that insulin is, is very convenient as it is. Uh, it's a very small shot. It's a baby shot. Anyway, the point I'm making here is that I, I have a very big history as a, a skeptic of medicine. Right? I'm not somebody that just flies the flag of pharma and says, I love all things pharma. I, absolutely not. Um, I had a website called Pharma Skeletons uh, years ago. I might bring it back. That uh, went through all of the, the dirty laundry of pharma because people were blaming me for all pharma's problems. And I said, hold on a second. Every other company, maybe they all haven't raised prices like crazy. Every single company has a litany of dirty laundry. Uh, and I said, you know what? Let me write it down and, and drop it. And uh, I, I put I put them all uh, down on there. And again, I, I 
lost the website because I, I went to prison and didn't renew my GoDaddy. But the uh, I saved it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the point is, you know, I'm, I'm no, I'm not just like a blind, you know, truster of pharma. Uh, I, I I look at data, you know, uh, through through the same lens, you know, logical one only. I don't particularly care what what experts have to say because when I look at clinical data, I'm the expert. I'm the only expert that matters. Um, ultimately, I need to have all the data, and I have to have the time and interest to look at it. Um, in the case of COVID, I haven't done a, the thoroughest. Uh, analysis. Uh, but the phase three data I've seen that was published in New England, New England was good enough for me, at least. And again, the stakes were low enough for me that I, I know that most vaccines just don't have that many side effects. It's, it's sort of the one area of medicine that you don't have to worry about side effects because it traditionally is just a small amount of, of inactive antigen, right? And, you know, the worst that could happen is you kind of have this overblown immune response, which I did not enjoy. I don't know if anybody else has a story, but I personally did not enjoy my, uh, COVID-19 vaccine immune response. It was extremely thorough, uh, to say the least. Anybody else have a, a big immune response? Me and my sister were out cold for days with this, just after the COVID vaccine. I've got long COVID. Yeah, some people didn't affect, but most people got Taken off their feet, I think. I got long COVID from all that mess. Not from the shot itself, but from the original infection. So long COVID's a funny thing. Um, I think you're not surprised to know that some people don't think it exists at all. Um, yeah, it's part of a disinformation campaign, in my opinion. <laughs> I, the the, uh, is, there like a, is there a definition for it, or is it just kind of a more descriptive... It's catch all type. It's, thing. it's the definite. It's called PSAC. Um, that's an acronym for uh, post acute sequelae COVID nineteen. Okay, Mark, did I pronounce all that shit right? I like sequelae or whatever. This fucking I, jerk in Russ. This guy has such a fetish for me. All he does is try to fuck me up. It is so weird. <clears throat> he spends his his entire day like breaking my bases. Well, at least he's not in the server. 